can just get started right now. And uh, as people filter in, we'll kind of do things. We'll go through everything. Awesome. Um, coaches, parents, prospective student athletes, um, welcome to this webinar. Uh, this is a this is an ASM. Michelle, what do we call it? Pathway to success webinar. Oh, always, always, always the pathway to always. success. Pathway to Success webinar. Uh, my name is Fabian. I'm, I'm the Director of Athlete Management here at ASM. Um, this is Joseph next to me. He's, he's one of the VPs here at ASM. Um, you know, together we've been working here many, many years now. ASM has been a uh, company for close to 10 years now. And we've helped, you know, almost 4,000 athletes come out here to the US as a, as a student and as an athlete, um, you know, on athletic scholarships. So, you know, the, the, the founder of our company, Chris Vidal, is originally from England. Um, you know, me and Joe are also from England. Michelle is from Barbados, um, but we've yeah, helped. And England. We have, uh, we've helped athletes from, from 90 different countries now. Um, so, you know, help them get into the collegiate system. You know, we know the, the ins and outs of, of recruitment for a multitude of different sports. There's 27 NCAA sports on the men's and women's side. Um, so really just helping student athletes guide, you know, guiding them throughout this process. It can be a daunting process. I've been through it myself, you know, coming over as an international student athlete. So really working out in this big matrix of, of 3000 universities here in the US, you know, what's the right fit for you? Not just as an athlete, you are using your gift as an athlete to, to help fund your education, to get a scholarship. But most importantly, you know, academically, what are you coming out with at the end of that four years? What degree do you have? Where do you want to be after that four years? And that's really important for us. That's why we're based here in Florida, um, so that we can not only guide our student athletes through the entire recruitment process, but also help support them out here whilst they're in the U.S. Because, you know, seeing seeing our student athletes succeed, which we'll, we'll talk about you know, one-on-one -on -one with a few of them later uh, in this webinar, um, closer to eight o'clock um, Florida time. Um, but really, you know, what, what are their goals after college? And that's what this is really kind of all about, this pathway of success. It's about setting up, you know, uh, young students to, to succeed um, in, in terms of finding them right, the right school, finding them the right balance, somewhere they're going to become a better athlete, um, and most importantly, become, you know, more mature, better, you know, young man, young woman, whatever it is, and, and really, really grow as a person and give themselves the right platform to go into the, into the working world after, whether that's being a professional athlete or whether that is, you know, going into the workplace after college. So the American system is, is very unique in, in the way that you can combine both. So, you know, combining your sport combining your academics, really doing both full-time um, here in the U.S., um, you know, to, to, to maximize your opportunities for afterwards. So us here at ASM, you know, we, we work with athletes from 14 to 18 years old, um, can be even younger in, in guiding the process, uh, guiding them through this process, but really giving them you know, giving every student athlete the chance to prepare themselves well for coming into college. It's, I wish it was as simple as just picking up the phone, ringing a coach, scholarship done. Um, but there are a lot of different things that coaches look for. And we're going to speak with a coach very shortly. There are lots of different things that coaches look for in this recruitment process. Um, in terms of not just your athletics and your academics, um, but also lots of things on, you know, you're going to a university at the end of the day, it's not a sports academy. So there are a lot of things, a lot of uh, things on that checklist you have to make sure that you're doing and you're doing well throughout your recruitment process. And, you know, all kids here in America, when they are 14 and they enter high school, everything is preparing them for college. So that's why, you know, starting this, uh, starting this process early can never hurt, um, you know, make sure that you're on the right track to, to go to the right school. Um, we, we obviously do work with athletes a little bit older and that process can be fast tracked definitely. Um, but you know, we always, you know, we have a saying here, 
Um, there's never a too early to start something like this or start this journey, but there's definitely a too late. There's not unlimited scholarships out there. They can't have 80 track athletes on a team and they can't have 100 swimmers or 200 soccer players. They have a limited roster size, limited scholarships. So it's really about putting your, you know, getting in the door early, getting your foot in the door early so that you can, you know, have a number of good opportunities and ultimately make the, the right decision when, when choosing a university. Um, so really my role here at ASM is, is a lot more on the placement side. We have a number of scouts globally who will, you know, go through what we call an assessment process, which, which Joe can go through in, in a little bit um, about really assessing an athlete where they are. But my, my job on this side is once we kind of know what we're targeting, I'm going to be the one with my team, which is now a team of, of 10 individuals, all former collegiate coaches um, who have recruited, um, who have been in the university system. They know the ins and outs of it and really just guiding our student athletes through that process, whether it is starting at 14 or it is starting at 18. Um, you know, help and, and as an international, you know, it doesn't just stop there when you sign the scholarship letter. You have, you know, visas, admissions, paperwork, things like that to do, which <clears throat> can be a little bit daunting. So, you know, we're just here to help throughout that whole process. Um, so I'll kind of let Joe take over a little bit. Uh, like I said, Joe is one of our VPs here and he can sort of talk about the scouting network of ASM, what we've kind of built and, and how we kind of work with our athletes and assess them to, to help them find the right fit. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's an absolute pleasure to meet everybody. My name is Joseph, like Fabian mentioned. Um, I sort of predominantly work on the onboarding uh, side of things. If we just want to make sure there's no people coming in or anything like that, first yeah. of all. But yeah, they come good. Yeah. Um, no, yes, obviously, I, I predominantly work on the onboarding side of things here at ASM to make sure that um, it's a very smooth transition into our service and to make sure that when athletes sort of decide to commit to our service, it's for the right reasons. Um, and essentially, the big sort of ethos here is that, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that all expectations are managed up front so that families and the, the prospective student athlete understands exactly, you know, what the best fit for them is. You know, we, we all talk, you know, here very passionately about the right fit. Um, you know, a lot of people have this perception in their head of what college sports is, and there's thousands of universities out here. Um, you know, I was born and raised in the UK, very, very different system. There's nowhere near, you know, 3,000, 4,000 universities like there is here in the US. Um, so as Fabian mentioned, it's a complete matrix, um, you know, and it's, it's quite complicated to navigate. Um, you know, so essentially how we kind of operate um, as a service here at ASM is, you know, obviously when an athlete applies with us or when, you know, a family wants to sort of inquire and learn more about us and potentially work with us. Um, what we do is, is what we call an in-depth assessment process. Um, and what that looks like is basically um, an assessment form that goes out to the family. Once we've kind of understood the, the pro sort of primary, um, you know, reasons for a family wanting to do this, if that kind of matches our ethos, um, we'll send them an assessment form which contains a number of different things. It's very simple, very easy to understand. Um, and that assessment form will essentially ask for, um, obviously personal information, but then all of your athletic information and all of these assessment forms are sports specific, obviously for a basketballer, you know, we wanna know what's your rebound percentage, what's your free throw percentage, what's your, you know, all those different things. For rowing, we wanna know what your 2K erg is. For, track we want to know your pbs and swimming we want to know your pbs soccer it's more video footage related and a lot of other team invasion sports um you know so once we've kind of got a lot of information as much as we need really to have a very accurate understanding of where that athlete fits in the collegiate system as an athlete we also look obviously most importantly at the academics of that student athlete how are they doing at school and obviously we work with um, you know, sort of uh, partner of ours, World Education Services, in order to qualify and translate your transcripts into the American system so that we can have a very accurate understanding of what your grades look like in the American system. Um, 
you know, once we've got the academic and the athletic information, then we have some personalized questions in there as well, which asks really important stuff, you know, like what makes you different from other athletes? What's the most important thing for you when, you know, with this process, you know, what are you looking for from this experience? What's the three most important factors that you're going to consider and take reasoning when you're deciding on committing to a university? Is it the weather? Is it the facilities? Is it the quality of education, the academic ranking, the geography? Is it the standard of soccer or swim program or whatever that is? Um, once we've understood all of that information and once we've kind of got a very detailed in-depth sort of assessment from that family, um, three times a week, the placement team and everybody else will sit down um, and do what we effectively call is an assessment and we'll generate for each athlete what we call an assessment report and that report will show you a number of different things and it will show you specifically which divisions we're going to target um, whether it's the NCAA the NAIA or the National Junior College Athletic Association um, we're going to show you specifically which conferences that we would target um, you know, which specifically which conferences we would target in order to make sure that we get the right school um, you know, and then sort of parallel to that, we'll give you some targets and most, arguably most importantly, um, what we think a realistic college budget will be in order to make that happen. Um, once we've got all of that, that's when a family is going to, you know, go away, digest that assessment report. And only when a family agrees to that assessment report and they look at it and think, you know what, this makes sense. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is the reasons why I want to come. That's when we can look at, you know, the services that we offer and stuff like that. So it's really, really important that we do that, but that's a very basic overview. Obviously we've got coach Rich here now, which I'll sort of hand over to Fabs. Rich, how are you doing? Oh, well, good evening, everybody. How are you guys doing? Yeah, doing really well. Awesome. Um, yeah, got it for, for everyone out there, Coach Coach Rich is, is a coach we work quite closely with. Um, you know, he's he's currently coaching here in Florida. Um, and uh, yeah, he's he's been I'll let him introduce himself. He's he's been there, done that when it comes to basketball. So I'll let him introduce himself to kind of everyone out there and he can explain a little bit of how he, he got into to you know college coaching. Uh, good evening, guys. Once again, um, my name is Rich Grand. I'm the, currently the head men's basketball coach here at Palm Beach State College. Um, I, I originally uh, got into coaching uh, when I was in college. I started on the training side um, where I was just mentoring players and just doing a lot of skill workouts and individual workouts while I was in uh, college just to make some cash. And then uh, I uh, played professionally overseas, got away from coaching a little bit learned a lot more as my about myself and as a player of what it takes to be successful just because when you're at the professional level everything is on you there's nobody really pushing you there's no dad there's no mom there's not too many coaches they just want to see results um so I came back to America um after uh playing three years in uh Cyprus and Greece and I uh kind of had like a realization like hey, uh, instead of getting an entry-level job, uh, let me just get right into coaching and starting with the grassroots because I already do have a little bit of a following back home. So I, uh, I got into coaching. Um, I started at the high school level at uh, St. Peter's Preparatory School in Jersey City. I did that for a year. And then I was director of basketball operations at Wagner College Division I uh, for a year where we were, the, uh, where we were regular season champions uh, of the NEC conference. And then um, for two and a half years, I was at a New Mexico Military Institute uh, uh, to JUCO on the Texas side, a junior college on the Texas side, um, where I was able to produce uh, 15 Division One players in two and a half years. Um, then I came out here to sunny South Florida after being depressed in uh, New Mexico for <laughs> two and a half years, Roswell, New Mexico. Um, and uh, yeah, it was different. Um, and then... <laughs> Learned a lot about myself, though. I mean, it was I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, have lived anywhere else for that for that two and a half years just because there were so many different life lessons that I learned um, living in a small town, being from a bigger town. Um, and then uh, I was at Broward College as a volunteer assistant. And then when Palm Beach State opened up, I uh, showed up in a suit, addressed everybody, and uh, 
I was able to get the job here at Palm Beach State. Um, so it's uh, it's it's been a journey for sure. And uh, some notes that I've definitely taken in regards to recruiting players, um, it, 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 it's, it translates like whenever I watch players in person, first off, I make sure as a coach, I get there early to see if they're early before a game. And I watch how they take their pregame ritual and see what their pregame ritual is. Usually as a coach, within like the first minute before the game even starts, you can see who the best player on the court is just because you can see how dialed in and focused one player is from everyone else, if that makes sense. Um, so that's one thing I definitely look at is how players prepare because I've always lived by uh, the mantra that the pressure isn't on you to perform. The pressure is always on you to prepare. Um, so I, I love guys that that are that enjoy the process and not just the game time access of it. Um, um, so during the game, I always look at body language. I watch how players communicate with their teammates. And that goes that's that says a lot um, because at the essence of any sport, what are we trying to do here? Trying to win. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you have teammates, um, when you have your teammate and he's doing something well or he does something productive that helps you win, I watch how those players correspond with those guys. And I also look at how players deal with adversity if they make a mistake. The most selfish thing that a player can do when he makes a, mis a mistake in like a team setting is to harp on it, talk to the refs, or put his head down. Because at the end of the day, there's another play that's going on, especially in basketball, because it's a nonstop sport. Um, so if you make a mistake, your first instinct is, to, okay, let me let me get the ball back however I can and be locked in. And then I always look at how players communicate, just diving into that a little bit more. When, when players take criticism from their coaches, are they replying back? Are they saying anything? Because, I mean, a coach, a coach, a good coach is going to pull you to the side and not embarrass you um, unless, unless you need to be embarrassed. But some players, they take that entirely too personable, personal. Um, and, and in this generation, people are a lot more sensitive. Like and when I was in high school, um, my, my high school coach was Tony Campbell, who won a ring with Magic Johnson, played with the Lakers, went to Ohio State. He was big time, you know what I mean? Six, eight guard. Um, so like I, I took heed to everything he said, whether it was good, bad or indifferent, however I felt. Um, so I, I, I really study how players take criticism because I mean, if you're going to come and play for me, then I mean, I'm really going to compliment you and I'm just going to critique you because that's how you get better. So if you can't take that hard coaching, then I'm not the coach for you, essentially. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I watch that. I study that. I watch how players, uh, the effort level, if, if guys are dialed in, not just when they have the ball, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's a different feeling when a player, it's a different sense when a player has the ball, he feels like he's engaged, but what are they, what are they doing when they don't have the ball? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or how are they how are they trying to affect the game in a positive manner when they don't have the ball? Are they communicating? Are they talking? Are they communicating at all time high, saying everything that they see, talking to their teammates, staying engaged? Uh, I, I watch that. You know what I mean? And, and like, it's kind of crazy because like when you go to AAU events or you go to exposure events and you and you you're studying players and you're watching players. Um, like each coach that's there for a game to watch a specific player, they're not even watching the score. They're just watching the player, watching every single dribble sweat come off of this player, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like it, it's 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 that critical because at the end of the day in this business, at the college business, your livelihood, my my kids' livelihood, my family's livelihood depends on these players and how they deal with things on and off the court. So I like to know every single different, every single thing, aspect of their life. Um, and how they compete. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, that's that's what I really study. Um, in regards to skill, um, it's a different game than when I was growing up. Like a lot more play players are a lot more athletic. They have a lot access to a lot more. Um, so, like I, I love big, versatile players, guys that are tall that can do a multitude of things, that can guard different positions. Um, that are athletic, of course, 
And, and being athletic doesn't necessarily mean that you, you're jumping through the gym or you're the fastest person. But when you have quick instincts, that shows that you actually work on your game, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, I, I love I love to watch. I love watching those guys as well. Um, so that's kind of like how I – like my process in regards to studying players, essentially. Awesome. Um, yeah, I know, Rich, you, you, you obviously – you know, in, in tick with what we kind of do here, you know, guiding student athletes through this process, helping them find the right schools. When you were kind of, you know, at the level you are at now and when you were D, when you were coaching at D1, director of basketball, how sort of early would you suggest people kind of looking into this? I mean, how early did you kind of get some recruits on your radar? Um, like how young, how young were they? You know, what kind of um, age were you looking at? In America, I mean... In America, it's 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 tough just because kids are playing high level basketball at an earlier age than I was. I like when I was four or five years old, I went to the local YMCA and I was learning from Joe Schmo how to dribble the ball with my right hand and left hand. Um, it was kind of funny because like my uh, my karate instructor was my my uh, my basketball coach as well at uh, <laughs> ages uh, five and six. Um, so it's uh I mean, so like guys are guys are getting after it early um, here, and uh, the main thing that players can do to separate themselves is to play more basketball and understand like you have to have a good balance of skill work and a good balance of playing just playing basketball. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of players that have all the skills in the world, but when you throw them in the fire and they're playing an actual five on five game. Uh, they're clueless. Um, and then there's guys that, that, that have never do that never do skill work and just play basketball all day. And they're just, they, they're the lights out the best players on the court. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's, you have to have a good balance of skill work and uh, just, just playing basketball and competing. Absolutely. Um, we kind of, we kind of got a question in here and I'll kind of say it and add a little bit to it. So, Someone in attendance said there are there are a couple of Jamaican basketball players in college. Do you accept video footage for international athletes? And then I guess what I can add is like, you know, international athletes you've maybe worked with, Rich and and why the ones that have been as successful, you know, as successful as they might have been, you know, why were they successful? Uh, so I've had a multitude of kids that have been from overseas on my team this year. Um, we have a player from the Republic of Georgia. Uh, we have a player from Croatia. We have a player from Serbia. We have a player from Haiti. We have a player, I'm missing one, uh, from London, UK. Um, so we have like six players from different countries, essentially on our team just alone this year. And uh, even though we weren't, even though they weren't as successful uh, as the American players here. And yeah, I do accept film of, uh, of players from overseas, of course, but I mean, I, I, it depends on where you're from. Cause I know certain places are hotbeds for talent. Like I know Canada, it's almost as good as you, uh, it's almost as good as uh, basketball here in America. And I know that the highest levels in the UK, it's, it's damn near better or as the same level as it is here. I know that in uh, the Canaries islands, like there's players uh, I know that, in the Caribbean, I know Bahamas, they, there's players. I know uh, there's just a multitude. Of, there's players everywhere. Australia, players. There's a bunch of players everywhere. So I, I definitely take players from uh, from overseas for sure. Um, but my biggest thing with them, when they come to America, it's a different brand of basketball. It's more so at your face, in your face, at your neck, trying to destroy you at all times. And sometimes, like, when players come from overseas, there's a transition that they have to make as players in order to be successful here in America. So I, I do I do like players that are from uh, the Bahamas, well, that are from different places for sure. But, like, it's kind of hard to be critical of, like, their, their, their footage when they're not playing against highly talented guys or as talented guys that they're playing against here. Um, yeah if that makes sense. But yeah, I do definitely take film from, from play, players from other places for sure. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. No, and then like kind of one thing, 
one thing to wrap up. I mean, one sort of nugget of advice you, you'd have for, you know, someone 16, 17, 18, looking to come out and get a basketball scholarship from overseas. It's hard for you guys to get over here and get a scholarship unless like you come here early or come here like two years prior to you graduating from high school. Um, just so you can prove yourself over here in America, just because a lot of coaches, like, as I said earlier, as I'm, uh, I was, I was alluding to like these coaches, they can't take a kid and say, Oh, he might be okay. Let's, let's offer him a, a $120,000 scholarship. That's not how it works. Like they have to know that this kid can come here and be an immediate impact player. Cause that's what coaches want. They want guys that can come in and be immediate impacts. Um, so I, my biggest suggestion would be to get over here if you're a senior, come over here, do a year of prep school. Therefore, you can get acclimated with the game because there is going to be a transition phase that you're going to have to go through to be successful here. Uh, just because basketball is different here. It's, it's completely different. You guys may be more skilled than us here in America. Some places you guys are more skilled than us in America. But like the way that our culture is here, it's, it's at your neck, it's cutthroat, and people are trying to take everything that you got. Um, so it's it's important that kids have that mindset, have that in mind when they're trying to come here in America and play. Awesome. Top stuff. Yeah. Th Rich, thanks so much for your time. Um, Thank you guys for having me. Sure. Everyone was, you know, on the, on the, on the Q and A and in the audience is very grateful for you coming along and uh, best of luck with uh, future adventures of basketball. You got it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll be in contact guys. You guys take it easy. Be Thank safe. You. Have a blessed weekend. Thanks. Bye. 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 Phew. Wow. Awesome. Why did you put me to follow to follow Coach Rich? Um, <laughs> that be it. How, how am I going to top that? I think the, everybody in the audience is just like kind of like blown away and speechless now. Yeah. No. He, yeah. He's a great guy. Obviously, he's done a lot of things here. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he's obviously still you know coaching here in Florida. So. People yeah, looking yeah. from out Florida and want some some more golden nuggets from uh, from Coach Rich. You know, be happy to help. Of course, of course. Um, I I think I'm up next. And first, I want to say um, thank you, Fabian and Joe, um, ASM um, Vice Presidents, on a Friday night at this kind of time, still at the cold face doing the job and doing the work. Of course, I want to thank Coach Rich as well. Uh, Fabian, you and I need to talk afterwards about a little joke that you played on me with respect to Coach Rich, but that's okay. <laughs> and um, I also want to thank all of the attending. Ooh, Mikhail is here. Okay. I wasn't expecting Mikhail to actually come in right about now. Um, I think I'll just continue and uh, we'll talk to him in a bit. Yeah. Okay, or do you, or do, yeah, okay, no problem. So I want to thank all the attending talented um, student athletes and all their families. I mean, this was really supposed to be initially a webinar to help introduce and to help educate and to help guide student athletes in Jamaica. And what happened was, is that people started sharing, sharing the joy and sharing the dream and it spread to the rest of the Caribbean. It spread as far as Suriname, it spread as far as South America, Guyana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and beyond. So there are people from all walks of life and their families and their coaches and coaching federation, sorry, sports federations and sports associations as well, and other sporting stakeholders. I wanna thank everybody. And I wanna welcome them to the ASM Pathway to Success webinar. My name is Michelle Marshall. I'm an ASM Scout Director here residing in Barbados. So you're going to hear me reference Caribbean and reference Jamaica or Bahamas or Barbados quite often. But everything that we're talking about here tonight is relevant to every single student athlete across the globe that is aiming for and pointing themselves towards the U.S. collegiate system. So uh, I know that Joe and Fabian talked about, Joe and Fabian, <laughs> hi, Mikhail. <laughs> hi. hi, Joe and Fabian um, talked about um, ASM. They talked about the fact that we work with almost 3,500 universities in the NCAA division one, two, and three, Ivy League, and the NAIA and the NJCAA. And people in the Caribbean hate when people use these acronyms or use these um, abbreviations and they don't explain what it is. 
But if you are looking and aiming towards going to America, you already know that NCAA stands for the National Collegiate Athletic Association. When we talk about the NAIA, that's the National um, Athletic, sorry, National Athletic Independent Association. So we're talking about those private universities. I get a lot of student athletes and their families that um, I speak to on a daily basis. A lot of them are asking for particular types of universities. They're asking for um, historically black universities. They're asking for universities that are connected from um, Christian values point of view. It doesn't mean that if you go to a Christian university, they will force you to go to church. It doesn't mean that. Or they're asking for smaller universities. We in the Caribbean and sometimes in the Commonwealth are accustomed to classes that have 30 kids or less. And a lot of these privately owned universities, the class sizes are small, as opposed to the NCAA, which are larger universities and sometimes larger um, size classes as well. And then there's the NJCAA. And most people who are from the Caribbean, we understand what junior college is and we understand what community college is. We know it's a place you can go and do vocational studies, but for what we're gonna talk about tonight, it's a place where you can go and do an associate's degree. If you are tuning in from South Africa, apparently there's no such thing there, and therefore it's a different pathway for you guys to success. And um, Joe and Fabian talked about the fact that this company has been around for 10 years, and it's about 5,000 success stories. And it's difficult for us as West Indian people with these tiny little islands to put our, wrap our heads around the fact that that this company is, is actually helped 5,000 families and 5,000 student athletes and over 900 last year, even though it was a COVID year. And we don't shy away or, or hide from the fact that COVID has, and the pandemic has affected the whole world. What we tell people is, it's a unique opportunity from a sporting's perspective to make your mark and to make your mm -hmm. mark forward if other people are stepping back. We also tell people that if you want to secure a collegiate sports scholarship, the best thing to do is to align yourself with people who know what they're like, who know what this game is like. And I hear Fabian and I hear Joe talk about the fact that so many of the people who work in head office are professionals. Not only are they professionals, they were exactly at the same point as you, wanting to go to America, didn't know how to get there. And all of them would tell you, not all, some of you got good charm stories, but one or two of you in the head office have got some ugly stories about what your journey was like because there was no ASM, because there was no hand to hold you. So what I always say to people that ASM is a for us by us situation. They understand where you've been and they understand where you want to go to and they're committed to helping you get there. So the thing is, I, I, to take a, a little step back is people say to me, how did you find me? That's the first thing. Well, we tend to reach out to people on social media and, and I apologize first to all families and all moms and dads who get a student athlete rushing up to them saying, this girl, this girl, Michelle got in contact with me and she says that I'm really good and I can get a scholarship. But there's a reason why we do that because we know if the student athlete isn't engaged and they're not sold on the process, then the whole thing falls apart. So what normally happens is that one of the 300 affiliate scouts from all over the globe, and we have affiliate scouts in the Caribbean. We actually even have one in Jamaica. And they tend to scout, they find the student athlete, they find the talent, they are the feet on the ground. They know all the competitions, they know all the tournaments. And then they try to sell me the idea that I should speak to you and I should speak to your family because you're so talented. Hmm. So the first thing mm -hmm. I do is when people are trying to sell me something, I say, well, show me the goods. So I reach out to this particular student athlete, this young lady or this young gentleman, and I send them an invitation to give them a complimentary evaluation session. And a, a lot of people, the first thing that they'll ask me if they're emailing me or it's coming through WhatsApp or it's coming through Instagram is, do I have to pay? And the first thing I tell people is, no, it's a complimentary evaluation. Because what I wanna get from you is why you wanna do this. I wanna know what your personal best is. I wanna know what your tournament experience is, what your academic performance is, and why you wanna do this. And there's three important pieces of information that Joe talked about before, but I'm gonna go into more detail. The first thing I wanna tell people is, if you wanna be scouted and a scout like Rich can't put eyes on you, the next best thing is video. If I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, yes, Michelle, I want to get scouted. And I say, okay, where's your competitive footage? And they say, I don't have any. <sighs> Ain't nobody got time for that. How are we going to scout you? We can't see what you're doing. 
Now, if it's a timed sport, like swimming or track and field, and you got personal best, and I, I could work with that. So that's the first thing I need is video footage. Are you in some kind of sport where you've got a personal best I can work with? And the next thing is I need a photograph of this school report that either you are very proud of or you don't want me to see. But unfortunately, I got to see it. So it's either the 2019 school report, 2020, if it actually had grades on it, or 2021. If you're a Caribbean student, then you've probably got a school report. If you're an American or Canadian student, you might got a grade point average. But I need to have an idea of generally the level of your academics. I'm not going to drill you. You know, I'm not a school teacher. I'm not going to drill you, but I need to have an idea. And the third thing is I want to send you that assessment report that Joe talked about. I want you to highlight all of the different athletic achievements that made you become the person that you are today. So that when I present you, when I present your video footage, your school reports, your assessment report, sorry, uh, form to the review board, they have a good idea of who you are. They know what you want. They know why you want it. They know what's important to you, whether it's athletics, academic, scholarship size, coaching style, diversity, location. They know everything about you and they can make a judgment call. So that review board that Joe talks about that meets three times a week, that's a serious thing. We have to know that you can secure a scholarship. You, no, 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 there's no kind of gray area here, right? The review board has to issue a re, uh, assessment report and this is, and, and the skinny is, and I, I'm gonna be a little bit more harsher than Joe. The skinny is either we can work with you or we cannot. Joe and Fabian know I'm a little bit of a nice lady. So if I say no, I'll say why. Then, then we're gonna say which athletic division that we know you are eligible for. Ivy League, NCAA division one, two, and three, NAIA, Junior Colleges of America, NJCAA, or you might be even gifted and going all the way to California and going to community, co community college there in the CCCAA. But all the parents <laughs> that are sitting here, there's a piece of information that they need and it must come clean, it must come clear, which is the financial range of budget that you as a family will need to add to a scholarship if your son or daughter is not a 100% full ride candidate. Everybody wants a 100% scholarship. You know, I wish, let's not talk about me, but everybody wants a 100% scholarship. But you, as a parent, you need to know if your son or daughter doesn't qualify for that, then what is the minimum or the maximum amount of money that I will need to add to this journey every single year so that my student athlete comes up at the end, a better athlete, a better academic prospect, which will lead to a beautiful career somewhere in the world or the Olympics and then a beautiful career. Then we're gonna say, these are the athletic conferences that we know, there's no guesswork, right? That your student athlete qualifies for. Now that gives all the mums out there a very good idea of where this student athlete's going to end up, you know, because mums like to have this idea. I need to know exactly where this and our daughter is probably going to be going. And then we're going to add some recommendations or notes that pertain to you individually and about your unique path to securing a scholarship. I then will share this report with you and I'll ask you to discuss it as a family. I'll ask you to write down some notes. And only at this point as a family, you can decide if you want your student athlete to join the ASM family. At this point, there's some people thinking, Michelle, that's a lot of work, a four page report. How much is that gonna cost me? And I'm gonna say, no, there's no cost to this extensive evaluation. Because we mm -hmm. want you as a student athlete, all these student athletes out there, and as a family to be sure that you know exactly what is realistic, what is achievable, how much is it gonna cost, and when is it gonna happen? Because we at ASM have a placement rate that's extremely high and we've gonna maintain it at any cost. Because if we enter, if we are willing to enter a contract with every single student athlete in their family that signs with ASM, this means that the contract stipulates that ASM must come up with an offer or multiple scholarship offers that fit all the parameters in the assessment report. And if we do not, the worst of the worst, the horrors of it is that we've got to refund you back your money. Clearly, <laughs> this means that as a family, you want to be paying for a quality collegiate response or 
result and not just a series of actions that may or may not result in an outcome. So in this area, we are extremely serious as a company. Yeah. Very, yeah. very, very serious. And you see both Fabian and Joe are nodding because it's, it's the reputation that we are working with that causes us to grow our network of contacts with head coaches more and more and more. And if you understand the process and how much it's gonna cost, it allows us to have that close one-on-one -on -one relationship with head coaches, which allows us to lead you to great athletic opportunities and great schools. So if the assessment report that we at ASM produce is positive and your family decides that you wanna work with us and we wanna work with you, immediately upon signing with ASM, people wanna know exactly what's gonna happen. I paid my money, Michelle, and I've signed on the dotted line. So what happens immediately? Immediately, ASM team, media team kicks in. We take all that information that you gave us and we create the athlete profile. People say, well, what, what, why, why are you doing that? Is it just gonna be something on the internet? Like it's gonna stay there and nobody's gonna look at it. And we say, no, it's a digital representation of who you are. So when you continue to do well in school, the grades will change. When you get more positive, competitive uh, video footage, we add it in there because we wanna use it as our main marketing tool to reach out to the schools that make sense for you. These people are busy. They got no time to be looking at all the little scribbles or whatever. It needs to be a precise format. And it says V for verified, meaning this company has verified that everything that you said to us is true and correct. Which means that the head coaches look at it. They know, because some of these people get what? 100, 200 emails a day from various people all over the world. They're only gonna open a few emails. They're only gonna answer a few calls. And ASM is in there because they know that when we come calling, we have the goods, meaning that you are part of the goods that we have to present to them to make their lives easier. These people, you need to get on their radar early. You need to get notice. And you need to get them to remember you when they're billing their 2022, 23, 24, 25, and 2016. You heard Coach Rich said, yeah, that this is a competitive dog eat dog game. And there are people who are in this game from the time that they're four or five. So if you're coming to us when you were 13 and 14 in golf and gymnastics and tennis, there are people who are trying to get here before you and time is money in this game. So ASN recruitment process, you sign up with us, immediately we get the media team working. We try to get you to bring more video footage to us, always giving Fabian and his team more information. So they have reasons to reach out to coaches because they know something new about you. SAT exam prep. It's very fashionable, Joe and Fabian at the moment in the Caribbean for people to say that they're opening up SAT tutoring. But I ask people to ask these people a question. When was the last time they sat the SAT? What percentage of people who have been with them have got over 1,100, 1,200, 1,400? How many people have ended up using that SAT score to secure a good scholarship at a good school? But with ASM, we have one-on-one -on -one tutoring. I'll talk about that. We review all of your scholarship offers because what we excel at is the multiple offer situation. Do you wanna be in a situation where you only get one offer and you gotta take whatever it is or do you wanna have a situation where you are the one doing the choosing? ASM obviously steps in there and we help you to verbally commit to a university. And as Fabian said, we could, start the university admission process. We help you apply for the student visa. And after that, we help you prepare for entry to the US. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, there's a yeah. big question that people always ask me, what is covered by the scholarship? At ASM, the scholarships that we facilitate for you cover tuition, accommodation, and books. In some cases, and maybe Mikhail later will let us know, you know, it will include a meal plan because we realize that when you get to America, you'll start eating a lot of rubbish and not your mom's food and might not be able to perform very well. <laughs> but really and truly, how a scholarship is made up of a pot of money from the academic side and a pot of money from the athletic side. So we always tell people that if you've got a great SAT score, then together with your athletic prowess, it could trigger a really big scholarship. You know, so people in the Caribbean, we know what the SAT is. We know um, it's an entrance exam for the four-year university. 
And we know it's marked on the 1600 points. What we don't know is how it's viewed and how it can be used. So I say to people, if I'm a head coach and I'm looking at you and you're a great track and field runner, or you are a great track and field jumper or a swimmer or a soccer player or a water polo player or whatever, right? And I'm looking at somebody else exactly like you in the UK and you score a 1280 and that person scores 1100 on the SAT, everybody in the audience is thinking, yeah, automatically the coach is gonna pick the 1280. But do we understand why? Because when you have a high SAT score, it is possible to trigger what we call a presidential scholarship and unlock funding worth upwards of 38,000 US dollars. So now people in the audience are really, you know, thinking hard about this SAT score that they thought that they just needed to study for a little bit and go to the local SAT exam and just try and scrape a pass, meaning that they got over 950. But I'm talking about the money that can come to help you with your future when you score 1250 and over. And then I also want to say to people as well, what does an SAT score mean to a coach? A coach thinks about somebody who's got a really good SAT score. I'm not going to have to really worry probably about their academic performance because they've proven to me, right, that they're pretty smart. But it also means that what you can do is bring or help me maintain the cumulative GPA of the team. Which means now that as a coach, I'm proving that even though I'm carrying my team all over all over the state or whatever to all these tournaments, my team is still performing well. So that means now that the school is probably going to give me some more money to help me with my athletic program. So these are great win-wins for a head coach. This is what makes a head coach think, okay, I'm going to trigger an offer to a student athlete from the Caribbean. Big question people always ask me, what academic qualifications must I have to be eligible for a scholarship? In the Caribbean, you have to pass at least five CSEC exams, including math and English for entry to junior college, or pass all the, the CAPE subjects that you are currently studying for direct entry into a four-year university. If you're in South Africa, you must pass your matriculation in high school for entry into a four-year university. Both situations, if you want a straight shot into four-year university, you need a good SAT score. And I'm saying need because I want you to get the biggest possible scholarship that you can get to the best possible university that you can get. But there's an alternative here. I think that we in the Caribbean always think of going straight to four-year university. We don't really think of the junior college route. But to me, it's a softer and easier entry into the US collegiate system. And you heard what Coach Rich said about coming to America early. So should you, should you decide to stay two extra years and finish Cape? Or should you trigger entry into a marker earlier and go to junior college where you get to understand more of what the game is like for your particular sport in America? So you can use your five C uh, CSEC exam passes that include math and English and go to junior college and with 32 to 36 credits, you could get an associate's degree. And you can use that associate's degree and ASL will help you transfer over to the third year of a four-year degree at a big four-year university because you're in America, because you are proven that you can compete at a high standard in America. And because you're coming from the Caribbean, you know, our, our academics is strong. So you probably get on the dean's list or president's list or on a roll at community college or junior college, together with the fact that you are doing better athletically, now is a chance for you to jump to a better four-year university that if you had stayed in Barbados or stayed in the Caribbean or stayed in South Africa and then tried to go when you're two years later, you see what I mean? So what you've done is given up two years that people have gotten ahead of you and jumped into the system in America. So that's the junior college route. I think it's a fantastic route for some people and it addresses some of the things that Coach Rich spoke about. Next question. Mm -hmm. What's the cost of university or college in the US with no scholarship? Joe and Fabian, I'm always shocked when families come to me talking about they want to secure a scholarship for the son or daughter and they have no clue how much university really costs. Done no research. So I'm gonna shell down some numbers here and give people with pens and paper in all different parts of the world that are gonna be shocked by my numbers. But without a scholarship, junior college or community college can cost between 15 to 25,000 US dollars a year. And four-year university on average 40,000, upwards they can get to 55,000. And the Ivy League, where everybody wants to go for some reason, 
Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, we're talking about 65,000 US dollars to 80,000 US dollars just a year. So now we understand, as Coach Rich said, if you are asking some person that hasn't met you to be sure that they want to fund your education to the tune starting at 120,000 US dollars, you know that you have to be bringing everything possible to the table. Because now we're talking about, he, he's talked about 120,000 US dollars, but suppose you're the sort of person that qualifies for an Ivy League university and a full ride, then they're willing to shell out 320,000 US dollars for you, which means that you must be performing on and off the field all the time. So after scaring people with that, let me just start talking about some small numbers now, because I've scared people with the big numbers. Let me start talking about some small numbers. Michelle, which is what, Michelle, oh, yes. There's one question in the okay. thing that we've got, which I think is really important that we that we answer. Address? And then I, I promise I'll let you keep going. Um, okay. Philip basically sort of asked, I'll read it out, sort of said, I'm not, I'm not completely clear on the role of ASM. I've heard that uh, you help student athletes gain scholarships. How, you know, what exactly are we doing? What's the process? Um, mm -hmm. I can answer that, Michelle, or you can go ahead if you like. I think that will put a lot more context into everything that you're sort of mm -hmm. educating about. I think that you should answer, answer that question because people have got to be tired of hearing my voice. I've been going on for a bit. <laughs> no, so basically, it's a great question. Um, yes, it you know, is. And, Fabian kind of elaborated on this right at the start. Maybe you missed it slightly, uh, but great question, Philip. Basically, a company like us exists essentially to bridge the gap between you as a student athlete, an international student athlete in most cases, and the coaches and the US college system here in America. So if you're you know, a track athlete in Jamaica, or if you're a soccer player in Spain, you know, Nine times out of 10, 99% of the time, you do not know the coaches. You don't know how the scholarship system works. You know, that network isn't there. Um, what we've done essentially is built a network over the last 10 years of hundreds and thousands of college coaches. Our job, our role is to market a student athlete's information as a student and as an athlete to the coaches with the sort of angle that we're going to be targeting to create scholarship opportunities at various different universities all over the country so we're essentially bridging the gap we exist because we have a very extensive network of collegiate coaches and you don't and so our job is essentially to bridge the gap and make sure that we are putting you in contact with coaches we're generating scholarship offers and putting your information your profile directly in front of the coaches so I hope that kind of clears it up a little bit for you, Philip. It's a great question. Um, we're essentially bridging the gap between the coaches and you, and we're marketing your information as a student athlete. So we're negotiating with these coaches, generating scholarship offers, creating the interest, and then after that, facilitating all of the logistics, the paperwork. We're essentially taking responsibility for your entire recruitment process. So you just basic, you've done the hard work. You've done the hard work in the classroom and you've put together an incredible athletic profile. We're marketing that information to the coaches so they know exactly who you are. And that eventually turns into scholarship offers. Once you commit to a university, they, they, we then essentially facilitate that entire process after that, the admissions process, the visa process, all of that kind of stuff. I'm not going to elaborate too much. I hope that's about as clear as I can make it. You can give us a thumbs up or whatever sort of yeah. message if that clears it up, but I'll, I'll let you continue. <clears throat> Yeah, Philip, I'll, I'll respond to your to your question with with me and Joe's email and, and Michelle's as well, if you want to reach out directly and get a little bit more information um, on that for sure. But hopefully Joe's question kind of, you know, outlined that. Um, awesome. We've we've made him wait a little bit, but we do have a we do have a guest here. Um, this is Mikel Carvalho. He's a, he's an athlete we work with, work with um, from Barbados. Mikhail was a under 18 record holder in the 200 meter, I believe, um, back in Barbados before we, uh, you know, helped him secure a scholarship at a Division One school, Troy in Alabama. Um, so yeah, it's it's great to have him on here. Mikhail, how are you doing? How are things going? How are you settling in? <laughs> hey, um, 
Good afternoon to everyone. I'm actually doing pretty well. Things are going pretty smooth here. I'm actually preparing for a meet in, well, I'm in Alabama, but a meet at the University of Alabama tomorrow. So that's quite interesting. Really, fantastic. Um, for those kind of, you know, thinking about, you know, taking this journey, I know, Mikhail, you, you start, when we first started talking, I think you had kind of started the process. You were, you had taken an SAT, you had kind of reached out to some of your coaches. Um, how was it kind of, kind of going before the process, before you start working with ASM, you know, and then, you know, after we kind of, you know, started helping out? Okay, um, the fundamental difference between like me on my own before I had ASM was that um, on my own, I had like a bunch of uncertainty. Like, I mean, yeah, I was reaching out to people, um, to coaches rather, and yeah, some were reaching back, but it was not like, I didn't have the competitive edge that I wanted to have when it came to securing a spot in the US. But when I started to like talk with you, Fabian, mm -hmm. um, I was able to, you know, just relax. Well, I mean, I had to do the stuff that you guys required, like um, get the videos in my PBs, you know, any newspaper articles of myself, essentially build a nice profile for myself. But then once that was finished, I was able to just, you know, relax a little bit, let you guys take over. And that was quite um, assuring, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. And then talk a little bit, I mean, for those who, who want to learn a little bit more about the experience in the U.S., you know, how's it kind of been? How does, how does you know, in track in particular, how, um, you know, the facilities at the university, the seasons, how does it kind of differ to, to when you were back home? Okay, well, one of the biggest notes um, that I at least would have to say is that it's cold. It's very cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, they say, oh, the South is warm, but the South is cold. It is actually cold. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, for the people that know Celsius, um, Troy actually reached like a temperature of like negative two. I was like, this is not common. This is not supposed to happen. It was 29 degrees Fahrenheit, which was crazy. Um, but moving on off of the um, weather, um, actually, there's also the polar opposite too. It gets blistering hot. Um, hot to the point where you can't breathe. And cold to the point where you can't breathe. There's actually a lot of not being able to breathe. <laughs> okay, sorry, let me move on. <laughs> let me move on. Um, the training, the training here is actually pretty, it's pretty good. Um, I mean, there's a step up from what I was doing back home because back home I only trained like three times a week. But here I train like six, seven times a week. Um, so that's fun. Um, and I mean, here we have like a big building like designated to um, this athletics in general, not only like track and field, but like football, um, baseball, any sport you can think about as at this um, university. And in the building, like there is like study hall or place you go to get a study or to get, what was the word? Tutoring. Uh, tutoring. Yeah. yeah. You can go to study hall there. That's one floor. And there's like another floor that has treatment. There's also like the weight floor um, and some other floors, but those are like for football because, you know, football is king here. Yeah. Um, but so there are facilities. Um, if you go further up north, you get an indoor track, but you, you really won't get it in the south. The most you will get is like an indoor um, football yeah. um, complex. Mm -hmm. um, what else is there? Sorry, the question is kind of drifting away from me, but I'm trying to remember. <laughs> no, no, just, yeah, I mean, just, just some of the, you know, the, you know, the kind of team aspect of it, obviously, you know, track and field is a very individual thing, but when you come here to, you know, it's a very individual sport, it's based on your, your times, but, you know, when you get here to, to the US, you know, I hear it, it's more about like the team, you know, you've got a team around you. Kind of thing. Maybe talk a little bit about the, the team aspect, what's kind of, you know, required from you as a scholarship athlete there and, and, and the team and your role in that kind of thing. I remember three points, team role was required. Okay. <laughs> um, well, track and field, as Fabian said, was, is a very individual sport. But when it was, comes to like collegiate or like, you know, high school sports, anything like that, um, it branches off from just being an individual sport to a sport that is like a team sport, which is kind of interesting because as an athlete, yeah, you want to do your best in your event, but 
you need to score points so that teams can win championships. Mm-hmm. And as a scholarship athlete, um, or a full ride athlete, actually, because like scholarships like come in percentages. Yeah. Um, there's like I think there's twenty percent, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, a hundred. Um, especially as like a full ride athlete, which is a hundred, um, you're expected to score for the team, not just do well for yourself, but score for the team, mm-hmm. because when you do well and you score for the team, you get, um, you give the team a higher chance to place in conference or even go to like regionals or nationals. I mean, to do that, there'll be allotted money from, you know, the school or from like the, what do you call it, conference that they're in. And that can help them improve the facilities and, sorry, a question came in, of the facilities and anything that, you know, they need to be improved. Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. Michelle, have you have you got any kind of questions for, yeah. for Michael? Okay. I got one question. Um, give me an example of a day in the life of Mikhail Carvello, full ride scholarship at Troy University in Alabama. Scare them, Mikhail. Let's hear what a day, a typical day for you is like. Typical action day. Well, um, I started going to sleep at like twelve a.m. So like midnight. Um, I make sure I get my eight hours sleep because usually I like go see ballet because I'm either like just coming down off the height of the day in front or just like doing school or doing prehab. Um, so like stretching, icing, rolling, um, strengthening exercises, my dorm right there on the ground. Um, so I usually go sleep at 12. I get my nice eight hours rest and then I wake up, I have a nice hour before my first class. Um, I usually just get up, you know, use the bathroom, shower, do all the necessary things I have to do. Um, and then I go to the dining hall, which is about maybe five, 600 meters away. So I walk there and I get breakfast. And then I rush from breakfast straight to class. And I go to class, you know, I do what I have to do, take notes, um, um, answer quizzes, anything like that any exams, any tests that may be required for that day, I do. Um, let's say for Tuesdays, mm-hmm. after I go to class at 9.30, well, 9.30 for Tuesdays, I then go to a class right after, which is at 11. So it goes from 9.30 to 10.45. There's a 50 minute gap for me to get from that class to the other class, which is like in the same quad. So, I mean, it's not that far. Okay. So then it starts at 11 and then goes from 11 to 12.15. And then from 12.15, I go to another class at 12.30, which is macroeconomics. So it was like pre-cal, visual arts, macroeconomics. And then after macroeconomics, it just goes to 1.45. I have training at 2, sometimes 3. So like I, I run straight from class straight to training. Okay. Then I go on the track and I give it my all. Um, sometimes I run until I can't breathe. That's a pretty common wow. um, theme here for me, not being able to breathe. <laughs> and it's kind of crazy because it's, because it's too hot or too cold yeah um, or but, I, but, but I'm sure you're going to say to me Michelle it's an experience it's a positive experience oh definitely I mean it is what I signed up for and it's going to make me better it's helping me to get better so I mean yeah in the grand scheme I just have to buckle down and just do it yeah Awesome. Awesome. Mikhail, Mikhail, talk a little bit about like the level of competition, you know, coming, you know, over from, from Barbados to, to now in the US. What's the kind of level of competition, especially at the track now? Okay, well, for starters, um, back in Barbados, it was just like me and another guy that was like, I guess, at the top in the one and two. But here, there are other guys that, you know, are my standard and a little above as well. So, with that being said, you have to always bring your A game to the competition or you will be beaten. And it's like beyond just trying to win, you're trying to improve. So, because like beyond my conference as well, there's like other conferences that I want to, you know, be able to beat. Like I want to be able to get to NCAA championships. So I have to like watch people from SEC, um, Pac-10, forgive me if I say that wrong, um, Big Ten, um, I'm not going to, ACC. But yeah, the point yeah. is that I just keep myself abreast with the rest of people because it's like some about conference is not the end all 
so like there's competition beyond the competition I face currently. So it's just there's, there's, you're just like engulfed with um, yeah. competition essentially. Awesome. Awesome. Brilliant. Mikhail? Uh, oh, sorry, Fabian, go ahead. Uh, I'm just seeing if there's some questions for you. Yeah, there's some questions for you, Mikhail. Um, wow. One question was how does the school spirit, like the school spirit that you're at right now, compare to your previous school back in Barbados? <laughs> That was a very interesting thing because, like, back home, I went to a school called Cobham School, and we were very, very high on school spirit. So, you mean the University I mean, of Waterford. Yes, please, the University of Waterford. Mm. Um, so we we're very prideful. So I mean, I mean, it's a little <laughs> less, but like, when it comes to competing here, um, the team is very. I want to say they move as a unit, I guess, and you want to do well not only for yourself but for the team and to like, you know, keep the coach happy. Absolutely. I've got another question. It's a great question. Um, just pull this over a little bit. So sort of asking Mikhail, how was your transition in terms of what you're used to back home? And we've got in brackets like a pool and then versus dropping in the ocean. Um, I mean, they're like different aspects you have to think about like beyond the school, beyond the training. I remember talk about those, but like beyond that, I mean, you're like, you're, you're away from your family. You're hundreds and hundreds of miles, even thousands of miles away. Um, so you have to mature. You have to let you know, buckle up and say, well, this is now my life. I have to survive. Because going with the same analogy of being in a pool to an ocean, um, at this point you're thrown into the ocean and you have to decide that you're gonna either swim or you're gonna sink. And I didn't come this far to sink, so I swam. Um, so beyond just like, you know, the emotional side as well. I'm not separately emotional from track, but beyond like missing your family and missing your, your foes from home, um, there is the track aspect as well. You're probably gonna train a lot more than you did back home. And sometimes you're gonna have two, sometimes three trainings in one day. Um, like some days you will have a training that makes you you just want to quit, but you just, you just, I'm done with this. I, I am done. And then you start to go to weights in the final hour. So, I mean, there's like, it is hard. And when I first got here, there were like many weeks. They were like, like, for like three months from like September to like November. I just took it day by day because if I didn't, I would like stress myself out of it. So, mm -hmm. I just focus on it day by day, did what I had to do, did the prehab, rehab, and then just rested and came at it another day and another day. And I just found the days went by after that. Also, there's school. I mean, in the Caribbean, we do a lot, a lot, a lot of school. So it was pretty easy adapting here. Awesome. Yeah. No, brilliant. Um, yeah, no, I guess just, just to fin finish up with you, Mikhail, I mean, is there is there any kind of you know, little pearls of wisdom, any nuggets you would give to, you know, bits of knowledge you'd give to someone looking at doing this, like knowing what you know now, being a student athlete now, any sort of info you would give to anyone, like, you know, thinking about coming out to the US and, and competing. Hmm. Apart from- What do I say? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> Apart from having to get, get used to a different weather. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Um, enjoy your time back home. and know that you're coming here to do something. You're not just coming here for fun. You're, you're coming here to achieve your goal. So unless you really want to achieve what you want to achieve, don't, don't come. Um, but if you do, just know that there are going to be some days we want to give up. There are going to be good days. There are going to be days where you're just, it's mediocre. It's just, eh. There's some days that you're going to just not want to get it because it's, it's negative two degrees. Where do you want to go outside? Um, but you still have to go outside and you still have to train in the weather. I won't repeat 200. So, I mean, all in all, is just be ready for it. Enjoy your time home. But when you come, just know you're coming to, you're coming to work and you're coming to achieve your goals. So business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brilliant. No, thanks. Thanks again so much for your time, Mikhail. Um, no problem. You know, all the best with best of luck with the rest of the season. I know you've got outdoors and, and meets and stuff, you know, at Troy. So best of luck to you. 
uh, this Thank season you. and the rest of the years. I know we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Okay. Keep on winning. Bye. -bye. Bye. I will try. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, we, we got one more guest. I know we made him wait. Sean, are you there? You put your phone down, run away. What's going on? <laughs> now I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. How you doing? <laughs> Hi, Sean. Hi. How you doing, my man? Are you good? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited. Happy that I had a free weekend for once. It's been a, it's been a little tough, but yeah. it's been good. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, Sean, I'll just give a bit of background for, for you know, everyone in, in attendance. Um, Sean is a, is a hundred and 200, you know, runner from South Africa. Um, he broke the under 20 record in South Africa for hundred meters and is on one of the all time lists for, for fastest hundred meter run by an under 20 athlete. So, um, he's, we helped him here at ASM get to the university of Houston. He's, he's training under, um, coach Burrell, um, and coach Lewis, coach Carl Lewis, who's, who's obviously you know, got quite a few Olympic medals. Um, his, his name is <laughs> himself. Um, but, you know, we started working with Sean and credit to him, you know, putting in the hard work in South Africa. But, you know, we're able to get him out here to, to Houston. So I'll let him introduce himself, how his journey's, you know, kind of started. How long, you, you've been now in Houston, what, eight months now? Seven, eight yeah, months? About eight months. About eight months. Yeah. How's it been going? How's the transition from South Africa? Uh, it was it was pretty good. I won't lie, because uh, with me, what happened is since you know we graduate a lot a, a later in the year, we start from January to December. I didn't want to come in the spring semester of 2020 because I felt like I still needed to take like a, a little bit of a like a break from like high school and then kind of like slowly transition into college life. Because I knew college life was going to be a little different uh, compared to high school because I was in boarding school, but everything pretty much went smoothly because when I got here. Uh, the team was welcoming. I mean, what one thing the coaches really focus on is trying to integrate like uh, freshmen into the team. So we we did like a lot of team events, uh, like team gatherings, like we work out together. Even though official practice was not starting, we did like a lot of team exercises, like cross runs and stuff like that to kind of incorporate everyone. And essentially, like even on weekends, like I don't really go out, but we still hung out as a team. And, you know, we'd have like game nights and stuff like that to kind of make sure like we're integrating everyone. So that kind of made my whole process smoother because we not we didn't have classes on campus. So obviously it's a lot harder to like socialize and make friends, but my team was always there. So that also made everything in the fall smoother. The the training staff, I mean, you know, being a D1, I didn't think it was gonna be this great. I won't even lie. It's <laughs> literally everything, everything you need is like literally on campus. You know, if I want treatment, I speak to the trainers, they'll help me out. If I need to speak to my coach, if I need to call home, obviously I can just call home. But essentially like everything was smooth and it, I could have not asked for any to, to, to like go any better. Yeah. So, yeah. No, awesome. Awesome. And, uh, we'll kind of, we'll kind of bring it back a, a little bit. I know we, um, like what, what made you kind of look into the U S and then obviously, you know, ASM, how did the partnership kind of start? I know we had a scout down in South Africa who came and, you know, spoke with you and, uh, and your mum in person, but explain like, what was the thought process? Maybe I go to the U S and, and how did the ASM thing kind of start? So essentially it was around about 2019. I was like mid year of my, my final year in high school. And I was like, you know, what? I don't really want to go to like a university in the country because I know like in terms of track, the country is not really that invested in track. And you know, like with American sports, you know, there's a lot of investments into it. So the opportunities is there. And also, if you look at it at the education side of things, you know, you're going to get like better opportunities there in terms of like, like, you know, not only degrees, but like jobs as well. And kind of like broadening your, like your work experience, et cetera, et cetera. So I looked at a whole lot of factors and I was like, well, I'm already used to being away from home. So then I called one of my friends, Tanolo Lamar, he goes to Florida State, um, for y'all don't know. And he basically was a world champion, world youth champion. And he's like one of my close friends. So I asked him like um, how he basically got the, like, like who are the people who, who, who he reached out to, like to get help and to go into the States. And then he referred me to ASM. And then ever since then, I reached out to a couple of people. It is, I think it was David first. And then David introduced me to uh, you and like all the other guys on the staff. And pretty much after that, you know, you guys told me a little bit about the States. I also spoke to Tanolo. And then I pretty much made my judgment around there. I'm like, okay, well, really, 
you know, the best, like it will be the best move for me because I know what I want and like what I want to achieve. And this is going to be the best place for me to do it. So I just mm -hmm. took my chances. You know, I was like, okay, well, you know, everything is pretty much going to work out because I'm going to get good coaching. You know, I'm going to get good facilities. I'm going to, it's going to be a better environment. You know, there's going to be a lot of competition. You know, I'm going to be forced to push myself. And that's what I love. Like, I just want to grow as a person, not only track wise, but education, because I still want to get a good degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, brilliant. Um, yeah, I remember when we when we started started working together. I know it was approaching your final year, and you were a, we were a little bit stressed for time. We were just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we I was calling coaches, and I was like, "Where's the money at? Where's the scholarship? We need to make this happen." Um, yeah. But for but for you, I mean, if you could go back, would you would you advise you know if, if speaking to a 16 year old version of yourself would you advise you know starting this earlier this process give yourself a little bit more time to just kind of you know make sure you tick all the boxes because you were taking yeah. sat in between your school exams and you were like yeah <laughs> and that's the thing like i like i was reaching out to like some of the the younger guys who like in my school especially like my my rookie and stuff like that so i was telling them like um if you like planning to go to the states it's better to start young so you already understand like your, your academics, you can't just start like picking it up in like your final year. You actually gotta be consistent with your academics, like literally from like when you enter high school, cause they're gonna ask for your transcripts from when you get in, especially when you start want, like looking into like Ivy League schools or like top tier D1 schools, they won't look at your grades from like, you know, eighth grade and stuff. And these are things you don't know. Cause you're like, ah, you know, I can chill now. You know, I'll pick it up a little bit, maybe next year. And, you know, that's what kids do. I mean, we all did it. You know, we procrastinate a little bit and we don't understand it until like, oh, you know, we get to like senior year in high school. Like, okay, I want to go to the States. But when you look at it, like academically, you realize, oh, I missed out on this. I missed out on that. Now you got to go to like, like, you can't really just start in D1. You got to go to, you know, JUCO and then JUCO, then you work your way up to like, you know, it makes you like your D1 dream even like harder to reach because, I wouldn't say it's ignorance for say, but like, it's kind of like, you didn't know, you didn't understand the sense of like how everything works and you don't understand the structure of it. So you need to know from like young, someone needs to be there for like, to advise you like, okay, um, you still need to be putting in the work academically as much as you can run the times. But if you're not running, if you don't get in the like good grades in certain classes, you're not going to be eligible to be like able to compete. Cause you get a lot of guys who are running fast times, but in D2, but they couldn't be D1 eligible, you know? And yeah. that's the thing, it's a harsh reality. So people, you know, need to actually, I wouldn't, they, they, need, they need more knowledge. And, you know, ASM for, for me so far, it's helped me a lot. I've, re I've, re I've recommended it to my, some of my friends as well. You know, it's, it helped them as well. So I feel like it's, it's very important that like you start young because I'm, I'm not saying too young. I'm not saying like 10 or 11, but like, <laughs> I mean, if you can, if you want to, you can, you know, but like, <laughs> You need to start at an age where you, you're able to, like, realize your responsibilities and you must be able to, like, okay, no, you know, if I really want this, I really got to be able to sacrifice and know that, okay, I can't just, it's not going to just happen overnight, you know, because even with me, I was just, I was just grateful that I've been consistent with my academics. So, like, being eligible, like, checking eligibility status and working with the coaches and making sure that my, my grades are good and track is good. It, it made the whole process a whole lot smoother, especially even though it was last, last minute. But, you know, anything can happen anytime. That's what I'm saying, that um, it's just better to kind of integrate into the system a lot earlier. It's going to make everything a lot smoother because you don't want to be in your final year in high school and you're writing like 10 exams and you still have to worry about SATs and making sure you get the right grade for the SAT as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. You, uh, you got a question in, in from someone in the audience, uh, someone attending. Um, with ASM placement at Houston, was it a match for your level of performance coming out of South Africa or are you feeling you could be at another level? I mean, this is the best level there is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, Carl Lewis is your coach. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> I've got two legends coaching me. I, ca I can't complain. I, I can't complain. This is where I want to be, you know. Yeah. It's not like it was only the OU offer I also had. I mean, I had pretty much a lot of offers from other like top programs, LSU as well. So, I mean, I, I can't complain. I really can't <laughs> complain. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Now good to hear. Um, no, awesome. Um, 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's good what you tell, because, you know, we always, when we're working with recruits, we always tell them, you know, you, you can run the times, you can be the best athlete in the world, but you're not coming to an academy. This is a yeah. university. <laughs> the coach, yeah. coach is hand to tied. If, if your transcripts don't get through, they don't get through. There's, there's, it, it doesn't matter, um, mm. you know, how, how mm -hmm. good you might be. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. And then, and then lastly from you, Sean, like day in the life, what does that kind of, what does that kind of look like? I know for the, for those of you who want to follow, Sean's got a, a YouTube page and there's kind of day in the life videos and videos of track meets, which he uh, keeps up to date, but uh, day in the life, like of a student athlete, what's, what's kind of the daily routine? I mean, we, we pretty much wake up pretty much anytime according to your schedule. Cause some people have like early morning classes at like eight or nine. Uh, mm -hmm. My classes start a, little, a lot a lot later, but obviously you have these conversations with your, with your academic advisor. They're going to put you in the right classes for your schedule, um, which is pretty cool. And then I wake up around about 8 in the morning, 8.30, uh, make my breakfast. Obviously then pre practice is normally around 11 or 12. And then depending on some days, we have two sessions, one session. And then in between... Now we're not really doing it, but in the fall when we have more in-person classes again, we're going to have like, sometimes you're going to have like practice and then go to class and then come back and then like have like some like weights after that. And then uh, during, during the times we work out and stuff, we get like, we can go to the nutrition center, get some food uh, or like some snacks. And then we can go back uh, to like the study. So basically we actually have an athletic center well, it's not just us alone. A lot of universities actually have it where pretty much all the student athletes can just do work and they don't have to actually go home like in between like classes and stuff like that. They can actually just go upstairs, use the school computers, catch up on like a few assignments in between like practices and, you know, uh, lunch and stuff like that. And then after that, when your day is done, you can go in for treatment um, with the trainers uh, wherever they are. And then after that, you can literally just go home and take it easy and chill or you can still hang around with the guys yeah yeah yeah. awesome no top stuff and uh lastly what's what, what's next for sean what's the six month plan what do we what do we got cooking up <laughs> i mean right now the big the big goal is is nc's the short term goal is nc's but well short term goal is really nc's and olympics because they're so close to each other um i just need to make sure that um i stay healthy uh compete and pretty much i, I hope I hope to bring back some good news within the next eight eight weeks. I think eight weeks. Na yeah, national wow. is in eight weeks. So yeah, awesome. No, Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure. Obviously, you know we'll be in contact. You know, it's a pleasure working with you here at ASM and and you know guiding you through the recruitment process. But now that you're here, it's good to see that you're doing well. You know, Appreciate too it. humble right now. Sean's ranked. Go on the rankings, you'll see Sean, he's, he's doing well in, in all the events. <laughs> he is, he is. Uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be in touch, obviously, Sean, but I appreciate you coming on. Appreciate it. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you, guys. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Right. Bye. Bye. <sighs> Again, I'm having to, to, you know, come in behind these superstars. Who is the person that planned this agenda? <laughs> <sighs> oh, Fabian and Joe, unless you have something to say, I'm just going to uh, do some summary points and, and start to wrap this up. And then we can go straight into the thick and fast of, of questions if there are more questions. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So we, we heard from a whole bunch of people today. We heard from people like Joe and like uh, Fabian who have been stakeholders in this recruitment game for a very long time. We heard from a very, very down-to-earth um, junior college coach about what it takes, what he's interested in, and what makes him queue up the money and want to offer some person a scholarship. And then we heard from two stars. We heard from Sean Kalen from South Africa, who was under the, the honorary auspices of the great Carl Lewis at the University of um, Houston. And we also heard from Mikhail Carvalho, who is a Fulbright um, scholarship winner from the island of Barbados. So we heard what it's like for them. And you can hear that there were a lot of similarities between those two young men and what they were having as their collegiate experience. And then Joe um, filled in a very, very important segment as into how we as ASN fit into this role and why we are here tonight. A lot of it is about education and a lot of it is about support. And a lot of it is about marketing you when you come to us at the right time. And I want to say that ASM, the first thing I, I, I struck me with ASM is, is the word access. 
which is access to working with sports professionals who know, and I put in big capital letters, know the US head coaches and they already trust us to find the perfect impact student. And you heard Coach Rich talk about an impact student. Why is it important? Because really and truly, are you gonna expect some person that hasn't met you to choose you for a scholarship unless people like ASM get involved, we get to know you and we say that we verify that you are the goods. And then the whole thing about on average, RTs at ASM secure around 35,000 US dollars per year in scholarship funds for a student. And I don't care which country you're coming from, when you multiply that in your own currency, that's real money, right? And the power of choice. And I heard that over and over again. The power of choice meaning you have the power to choose what collegiate experience you want and where you want to go to school, as opposed to waiting for a scout to come down to the Caribbean or come all the way to South Africa or Suriname or Guyana. And most of the time they just have one offer to their team. You might fit in their team or you might not to a school that you might not want. And also for a decree course that you don't really want to study. But when you have the power of choice and we are helping you and giving you the power of choice because you've come to us in a timely fashion, then you can choose the best path to success for you. And then we, and then of course, one thing that struck me is the pathway to a higher SAT score. And I spoke all about that. I spoke all about why is it important? It isn't just an entry exam. It's really the gateway to a fantastic scholarship. And also the word guidance as in professional guidance guidance on the athletic and academic performance. You heard Sean talk about that. The knowledge of understanding at an early age where you need to be. All of us, or well, most of us young people in here are target focused people. We're competitors. If you guys have a goal to point towers, you will achieve it. So coming to us early, the longer head coaches, we are given head coaches, the ability to follow your positive improvement over a period of time. So you'll be showing coaches in the US, even before they meet you, that your trajectory is up because you're getting better and better. So this will make them want to secure you earlier because now you are a proven entity. You are surefire impact athlete and not a flash in the pan who is gonna fizzle out on entry into the US university system. And you heard Mikhail talk about that transition period. And you heard Coach Rich talk about the transition period. And what we didn't talk a lot about tonight is the fact that ASM offers a pathway to professionalism, or we call it a pathway to pro. So in a professional sport with a professional team, that pathway is, is there. And coming on stream soon, we'll be able to help you with further career development and career placement within the extended global professional sports arena. I meet a lot of student athletes that say, I want to get a degree in sports management. That says to me that you want to stay in sport beyond being a sports person competing yourself. So to say it all, today, today was about, or I should say tonight was about a pathway to success. That's why it was called a pathway to success. Where you find professionals at ASM who have been exactly where you are now. And then they got to exactly where you want to go. And they also know exactly how to get you there. Me included. And those are my two cents. If we could go to question and answers, unless Joe and Fabian wants to say something else. No, no absolutely. We, we've got some really, really, not only good, but interesting questions as well. But I think it's, it's obviously really important that we clarify this, uh, okay. some of these and elaborate a little bit. Um, I can sort of start with a couple that I've seen filtered throughout you know, the attendees and stuff like that. One, one that stuck out to me was um, basically sort of saying, listen, I've identified four or five colleges, um, you know, that I'd be interested in. And is, is that really a good basis to start? Is that a good place to start? And in a lot of ways, it is. It's a great place to start. One thing that, you know, if you're going to do this process on your own, um, you know, probably want to and not use a service like us, one of the most important things that you want to do is sort of think about what you want from a collegiate experience, you know, from an academic perspective and an athletic perspective. And then you need to go and look at what the requirements are academically. Um, and you also need to look at the rosters of these sports and you need to look at the level of competition within those, within those people, within those teams. And you need to compare yourself to that. Um, you know, and if you are considerably off the mark, whether it's 
you know, let's take soccer, for example. You know, if it's a top division one program, probably the vast majority of players, you know, in that program are going to be academy level or maybe international level. Um, you know, if it's swimming, do your PBs match up with, you know, the athletes within that team and not just match up, but exceed? Because remember, coaches are looking for athletes that are going to come in and make an improvement to their program. They don't just want to keep recruiting athletes that are at a similar level. You know, coaches get paid a good amount of money. And, you know, with that comes a lot of pressure and responsibility. And that responsibility is that they want to get the, the highest rank they can possibly get in the NCAA rankings. You know, and within that, they want to push for national championships. And their job is on the line if they don't do that. So in order to get a better ranked program to reach, you know, conference championship, regional championship, national championship, they need immediate impact athletes are going to come and improve their program. So just kind of summarizing that question, what I would recommend is looking at the universities that you're targeting academically. Do you fit? What are the requirements? What's the SAT? You know, what sort of GPA do you need? Are you sort of hitting that? And then secondly, athletically, are you either on par with or potentially even better than those schools as an athlete? And if it's a team invasion sport like basketball, soccer, rugby, field hockey, for example, obviously, you know, that's where a service like us is even more handy because we can evaluate that for you um, and understand if it's more statistic based, maybe more like golf, you know, with tennis, obviously your UTR and the ITF system. And then you've obviously got swimming and track with your PBs, rowing your, you know, 2K erg. You can sort of see with those sports, okay, this is where I fit into the college system. Um, obviously, we are here to do that evaluation for you and show you where we feel a good fit is. But it's a great question. I hope that clarifies it. Um, another quick question was, how do I apply for a scholarship? Um, you know, if you wanted to sort of gather more information um, about the collegiate industry, how it works, you know, that kind of thing, you can just apply on our website at www.asmscholarships.com and um, that'll put you through to one of our experts who can basically provide an in-depth assessment and help you navigate through this process um, you know in terms of applying to a university that's done on the university websites and if you're trying to apply for a scholarship athletically obviously you'd need to be in contact with the coaches um, the another good question that came through um, was sort of I'm I'd quite like to defer a year, I'd quite like to take a gap year in this process. Um, but some people have advised me not to do that. Um, you know, what would we recommend? So it's a great question. It does depend on the context of your situation. Um, it depends on the sport and various different things. In a lot of ways, there's nothing wrong with a gap year. And we recommend gap years to a lot of our athletes, depending on the circumstances. If you visit this recruitment process too late, you have to understand that this system is like a business. Coaches have a certain amount of money that they can spend per year on incoming recruits. The closer you get to that enrollment date for that year, the less money there is available. So if you start this process six months before you're due to arrive in America, chances are there's probably not that much money available. And obviously a lot of families don't want to sacrifice the quality of education or the scholarship or the quality of the athletic program so sometimes taking a gap year in order to use that time to utilize more opportunity for more offers, especially for us to tap into our sort of network, call coaches and generate offers, it usually comes down to a financial thing or maybe the amount of roster spots a coach has. So depending on the circumstance, gap years can be amazing. Um, if you take a gap year to, I don't know, travel to Bali and, you know, have a life-changing experience, that's not really going to cut it from, you know, a recruitment perspective because coaches want you to use a gap year as a tool to grow as an athlete, improve as an athlete and as a student, not as some time off to chill out and, you know, take a chill pill. Um, so depends on the circumstance, but it can be incredibly powerful to take a gap year from a scholarship perspective and to get your overall college result. Um, yeah, and, and just adding to that, so eligibility-wise, you know, you have, um, you know, four years to compete in college, 
um, and usually the window, depending on the division, will say five years to compete four years. Um, so, you know, as long as you take that gap year, you can compete in that gap year. What you can't do is compete for another university. So if you stay in your home country and go to a university and compete for a year, that's going to start your eligibility clock. And when you come out here, you'd only have three years left. So you always have four years to compete because, you know, the average degree out here is four years. Um, but, you know, every single sport has a, you know, five years to do four seasons. So you do, you know, get that gap here. Um, that's at the NCAA. At the NAIA, it's a bit more lax. Um, you know, you usually have six or seven years to compete for four seasons. So sometimes you see a little, some older athletes there. Uh, in the NAIA, but uh, hopefully that answers the question. Um, I've got a question for from Kahim, who's saying he was looking at the athletes page and noticed less than 10% of the profiles are marked as committed. What is happening with the others? Why is the commitment rate so low? So I can kind of answer this on, on the side of placement. So what we have on the athletes page is we want to make it useful for the coaches to actually navigate. If there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of commitments on there, it becomes a little bit difficult for them to navigate. So we do have a separate commitments page, which we could definitely send through. If you want to send your email, there should be a way to get to it on the website. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, we, we leave some on there, you know, to show, you know, various commitments and that we can still send out profiles um, to parents, you know, but um, we kind of have a separate page for commitments because we want, that platform to be easy for coaches to to kind of you know navigate and and find recruits that they're looking for hopefully that answers that question yeah so to find that commitments page all you have to do is go to www.asmscholarships.com forward slash commitments and that will take you straight to that commitments page and it's it's separated between ncaa division one division two division three naia junior college so it's all very clear for you to see sort of the the athletes and then you can obviously go on the athlete page i just added it joe oh perfect okay awesome. in the chat this is in the um, chat says thank you he's got it perfect um one question was sort of probably referencing when we were referencing more sort of sports like track and, and swimming with pbs one question was what about sort of the recruitment process for sports without that kind of statistic like pbs and stuff like that um so when you're looking at sports, you know, I, I played collegiate soccer, for example. And, you know, so the most important thing when, you know, you're trying to market yourself to a coach is you want to give them that's, that's a team invasion sport. It could be soccer, it could be basketball, rugby, field hockey, ice hockey, you know, all of those sort of team invasion sports. The coaches are going to be almost completely dependent on video footage. Okay. Um, obviously you can come to the U S and have showcase events and tryouts and stuff like that, but that's not realistic for everybody to fly out to the U S and do that. Um, it's obviously an enormous financial investment to do that. So the coaches are going to be almost completely dependent on video footage. So the most important thing is that when you present your video footage to a coach, it's geared to a way that is easy for a coach to watch. And it's a very, very accurate representation of your ability as an athlete. You know, we get a lot of athletes come to us that have, you know, one minute and 30 seconds of soccer footage. And some of it is, you know, just sort of shooting into an open goal, for example. That's not going to give a coach an idea of who you are as a player. Can you compete at that level? Are you going to be an impact athlete? Coaches want to, want to understand that athlete and they want to see, all right, based on this video, do I see this athlete coming in and making an immediate impact or being a scholarship candidate? So when you're looking at sports that are not related to statistics, PBs and that kind of thing, you wanna put all of your time and energy into creating a video highlight. We have a media team here that edits all of the video footage for you to make it as marketable, as presentable as possible to coaches. Um, but you need to work really hard to gather as much footage together as possible so that it's as digestible as possible for a coach to evaluate. Yeah, awesome. So there's a, yeah, we'll just quickly go through the, the questions. Sefton, do you have football scholarships? So um, 
football is in soccer or football is in American football. Uh, American football, obviously, American football um, is the most widely offered sport here on the men's side. Um, so yeah, we do help out with that and the evaluation assessment. Football, you know, I've been in America too long. You know, I, I we call it soccer if that's what you're talking about now. But football scholarships, yes, absolutely, um, huge on the women's side, big on the men's side. Lots of scholarship opportunities available. Here in the ASM office, we have two former collegiate football coaches um, and, you know, six other scouts who played collegiate soccer. So, you know, al almost too many uh, footballers here in the office, but hopefully that can help. So apply and, and one of them will reach out to you. Um, let's just go through. <clears throat> so we have one quite specific question on... CSEC mathematics. It's on, on CSEC, Michelle. This might be. This is a good one for you. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. I think it. Yeah, it's 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 CSEC and, and Cape units. Okay. We we uh, me and the placement team will really we have a eligibility and academics expert who works very closely with the NCAA and NAIA. So, what would be good if is if you if you reach out. Um, it says you're in your second year of sick form. So yeah, definitely reach out. We'll take a look at everything academically that you've done in the last few years um, and make sure that you're all el eligible. And, you know, if you're not eligible for NCAA, you know, guide you through NAIA or uh, yeah. junior college route. So we can help you out with that. Yeah, they can reach out to me and I can have a chat with them and then they can pass, pass it on and so on. No problem. Absolutely, awesome. Let me scroll down to question yeah um for a swimmer what would potential roster opportunities look like for someone who has not specialized in a certain area in the sport yet um so basically i mean it's interesting that you bring that up um marina she's one of our swimming directors here she's from brazil she was a former collegiate coach and a collegiate athlete as well um if you're sort of referencing that you compete across various different strokes as a swimmer it's actually a really good thing um, coaches want diverse swimmers because similar to track for example um, a lot of it is points based so you're swimming as an individual but often for your team so coaches want swimmers that compete in lots of different strokes and very competitively because that creates more opportunity for you to hit more point opportunities to win for more points to be added to your team so that you qualify for regionals or different meets. So um, to sort of answer that in short, you know, it's obviously good to have your strongest stroke that you can show a coach so that when you target universities, a coach knows what your big event is going to be. But more importantly, coaches do really like diverse swimmers. So it's not a huge issue. If you're pretty competitive, um, you know, across various different strokes, it's a good thing because it means that a coach can utilize you in different ways. Well, mm -hmm. Good question. Awesome. Um, one person has said, not in soccer or basketball, in synchronized swimming. Uh, definitely reach out to us directly. Synchronized swimming isn't a massive NCAA sport, but there are particular opportunities at certain universities, scholarship opportunities or club sport opportunities. So we'll be able to help you out um, if you reach out to us. Yeah, they can reach out to me directly on that one for sure. I think this question was more for Mikhail and Sean. While you mentioned being able to make other conferences, did your placement match your level of performance and have built you to a much improved athlete? Um, yeah, I guess, you know, with, with those guys, we'll see over time in, in how they develop. Um, I know on, in Sean's case, you know, he's ranked fifth Um in the whole of the NCAA for 200 meters. And I think he's top 10 in the 100 meters right now. So we'll see, you You know, it's halfway through his season. So we'll see. And, and Mikhail is, is currently got the best times on, on his team at Troy. So we'll see how they get on, um, you know, over the coming years. Um, there's a good website, tfrs.com, where you can follow all the, on the track side, you can follow all the times um, of what track athletes are running out here in college. So that's a good, any prospective student athlete looking to come out and, you know, saying I want to run at LSU or I run at, run at Texas or Florida, use that website as a tool. You can see what those guys are currently running now um, to kind of gauge as to, you know, where you need to get to or if you're already at that level already. Hopefully okay. that helps. I've got, I've got a question as well. Say that again. I've got a question as well um, okay. from Shane. 
He says, if you play more than one sport, would you get two different athletic scholarships? So this is this is kind of this is kind of a tricky one. Um, you can be a dual athlete out here as long as the sports are in two different seasons. So, you know, there is the fall semester, which is August through December, and there is the, you know, spring semester, which is January through till May. So if you're competing in two different sports that are in different semesters, you can get, you can get an athletic scholarship from both. It's very, very tricky, and it really depends on the coach because if one of those is, you know, a high volume or contact sport that could potentially injure you for the other one, it does become very, very tricky. But there are athletes out here, you know, that do soccer in the fall and track in the, uh, in the spring. Um, or, you know, you see a lot of top level American football players, you know, play American football in the fall uh, and then do track in the spring. So it will really depend on, on the seasonality of the sport. Um, it is achievable. It would, uh, yeah, it would, it, it's something we could do, but you know, you'd have to be exceptional at both and it for really makes sense for both of the coaches to have you compete in both. So achievable, difficult, but you know, if you're a stud in both, um, you know, absolutely a university want to have you for both. I have, um, I noticed one question that was on there that I don't think we've touched on yet was, was basically sort of the right time we sort of reference the right time to start this process. And it's a great question. Um, I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible because I could ramble on for hours about that. But basically, in my opinion, I think the right time to start this process, I'm not going to put an age number on it because I work with athletes that are coming out in 2027. And I also work with athletes that are coming out in 2021. Um, ultimately, when you've made the decision that, getting a scholarship to be a student athlete in the US is what you're categorically aiming to do. And it's something that you want to aim for. That is when you should start your recruitment process because you can never be too early, but you like Fabian said right at the start, you can be too late. Um, you know, starting the process as early as possible gives you more time to market yourself to coaches, to speak with various coaches, to decipher between different offers it takes stress away from the SAT, having a social life, you know, trying to navigate through your academics at your high school, all of these different factors, allowing more time just creates a healthier recruitment process. Um, you know, if you're not sure about whether you want to come to the US or not, you know, probably coaches will feel that on the phone if you speak with them. And so I recommend starting the process when you've made the decision as a family that this is what you want to do. And when you've made that decision, that's when you need to start getting active because there's nothing that you can do wrong the earlier you start. Um, the later you start, it'll cost you money and the overall quality of your college placement in terms of academics and athletics. Yeah. Just, just to put a few things in perspective, you are, but the NCAA has rules as to how early they can start speaking to someone and how early they can, you know, offer them a scholarship. So you are allowed to start speaking with a college coach June 15th of two years prior to your, to your enrollment date. So this June 15th coming up, they can speak to everyone who's looking to come out in 2023. So it's very, very far in advance. In terms of you actually signing your scholarship letter, that is the November prior. So for 2023, it'd be November of 2022. But you can verbally commit to that university before. Um, but yeah, just to put it into a bit of perspective, you know, being in, you know, being an international student back in back in England, we wouldn't start thinking about applying to university till our last year of school. Well, when you're in this game of getting an athletic scholarship, you know, coaches have been speaking to guys for, you know, 18 months or a year before that. So really, you know, two, two and a bit years is when you can start speaking to coaches. So, but like Joe said, it is when you really want to, you know, dive into this process, whether that's three years, four years, or, you know, a year before, it's totally up to you. But just hopefully that kind of timeline, those dates will get put in put, uh, some perspective. 
Um, awesome. Uh, Philip, thanks for your kind words. Um, and you have another question about cricket and netball, neither of which are an NCAA sport right now, currently. So um, if they play other sports, we can definitely help, but not, neither of which are currently an NCAA sport. Um, is yeah is there an age limit to the student athlete that you help guide to an athletic scholarship so i kind of touched a little bit on this before but it's going to depend on the division um it's going to depend on the sport some have you know different parameters um you know if you're older than and it also depends if, if you're at university, you know, we, we are currently working with a couple of students who are 22 and 23 years old, but you know, they're at university, they finish universities and they're, and they're looking to pursue a master's degree. So that's always another option as well. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the circumstance in terms of age, but you know, we'll definitely, you know, reach out to us, we'll take a look at everything and, you know, depending on the sport, the division would we'll definitely help you out. I think there's one question there that I that I noticed, which is a really good question, especially given the re relevance of everything going on in the world with the pandemic and stuff like that, and the inability to get video footage. Um, and this is something that we, you know, sort of deal with on a daily basis. Athletes coming to us that have played at a range of different levels that might have competed for their country, you know, or or maybe it's slightly more recreationally and, and locally, um, but they've got an inability to get video footage um, and. You know, what I kind of suggest to that is, you know, what we do is for a lot of team invasion sports, for example, like water polo that was referenced here, soccer, rugby, you know, I've been through them before. But what we want to do is obviously we would usually provide an assessment and we want to kind of learn about your academics. We want to learn about the standard that you're competing at. You know, if you're a water, water polo player, you're, you're representing your country, you know, and you're six foot eight. Well, there's a conversation to be had there. Um, you know about about what we can do um, one thing that you can do without video footage is be on the radar of coaches and that's something that we talk about a lot here at ASM it's very likely that you won't be receiving many scholarship offers without video footage so you know there's a there's a very high chance that coaches are not going to invest in a scholarship if they can't see you compete in some capacity whether it's video or in person but what you can do is get on the radar of coaches, let them know that you're a candidate, let them know that you're aiming to do this. They know your profile. They've seen the standard that you've competed at, all of your club history, academy, national level experience, all that kind of stuff, your grades. And when the time comes when you do get video footage, you've already been somewhat introduced to the coach in some capacity, which just puts you ahead of everybody else that's not applying. Okay. Um, but yeah, I hope that sort of clears that up. Awesome. Um, okay. I've, I've, I've got a question. Well, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, partnerships. I've had a few people over the last few days, um, industries, uh, sports stakeholders, asking a question about how ASM has worked in the past with other associations and other federations and athletic clubs to secure a pathway to success for their particular student athletes. Absolutely. So listen, obviously ASM is, is all about the athlete, right? So the most important thing for us is to kind of understand what that governing body, association, whatever it is, you know, really wants for their athletes. Is it just education? Is it actually getting in contact with coaches? Um, you know, we're partnered with lots of different organizations all over the world from an academic perspective, not just athletics, but also from a sport perspective as well. Um, and we can create partnership opportunities in lots of different ways, whether it's, you know, webinars like this that are purely educational to help families understand the process that are weekly or monthly or whatever. Um, you know, we can sort of build a page, you know, in which case there's lots of education and videos and resources for athletes you know, that's sort of personalized by that organization as well. Um, you know, where families can, that have been directed from that organization can come visit that page that we sort of create. And then we provide an assessment process for those athletes in order to qualify and understand where do they fit into the college system. So yeah, there's lots of different ways that we can kind of, um, 
you know, do partnerships, but it's really common and ultimately it's whatever's appropriate for the, for the organization and the app. Yeah. I think what's really important when we partner with a particular organization is, is what they're kind of looking for. I'll take an example. We partnered with Leeds United, the Premier League football club. And the partnership is really about, we're working with a lot of their soccer players that have just been released from the academy. These are guys who have worked tirelessly to become a professional footballer. And suddenly they're now not on the radar to, to be a professional footballer for that club. So in their mind, they want the best stepping stone to get to professional here, you know, in the MLS in the USA. So we want to place them at, give them the right pathway to get to a, to get to the MLS. And that means placing them at a really competitive program here in the US. So finding them with a really high level of soccer that, you know, has all the facilities, has the strong schedule, gives them the right exposure to get to that level. Um, and obviously they're going to get the luxury of getting the degree as well. But, you know, if that's just, you know, one particular um, example of a, of a partnership and, and what they're looking for for their kids. So we're always, like I said, every athlete is different in what they're looking for. So really, if we're going to go into a partnership, really diving into you know, what the student athletes, you know, young, young, young guys, young girls, what they're looking for typically, and you know, how we can tailor it to that specifically. Got a couple more questions. Um, is sort of training a good supplement for video footage if it's difficult to get? In some circumstances, it can be, you know, potentially enough more than like, I'm going to be super critical and super conservative. Nine times out of 10, probably they're going to want to see competitive game footage of you competing in that sport because that's as close a representation as a coach can get to what you would be like in their program and how you would contribute so typically training footage isn't going to cut it for team invasion sports but often you know everybody here from from the placement perspective can sort of provide a very basic conservative assessment based on that but more than likely we would be open not enough to open and honest enough to sort of say, listen, probably going to need game footage to get this done. Um, and that's purely us trying to manage expectations and stuff like that. Um, so I hope that clears that one up. Okay. Had another one sort of relating, I think somebody came in late and, you know, Michelle sort of extensively spoke about the academic scholarships and what if I want the sports scholarship to be the priority, you know, the main source of scholarship. Um, it's a great question. I think, one thing that you have to understand is that you don't have to choose one in order to sort of get a bigger scholarship. Um, a coach can take a certain amount of money from the university academically, depending on your, uh, you know, test scores and your GPA. Um, you know, and he can also, he or she can also provide sports scholarship. So what we're sort of saying is, is that the harder you work, the more you reach for the stars from an academic perspective in your test scores, the more marketable you are to a coach, because you have to look at it like a business. Um, you know, a coach essentially has a certain amount of money they can spend. If that coach can only has to give 50% to you because you qualified for a 50% academic scholarship, that's really attractive to a coach. But if you don't qualify for an academic scholarship, that coach is now forced, if they wanna make you a very competitive, exciting offer, to give a significantly bigger scholarship, which costs them money. You have to look at it like a business. So, you know, a coach can give you a 100% sports scholarship and there's no need for an academic scholarship. But if I was doing this back in the day, and what I know now, being an expert in this industry, I would reach for the stars with the SAT, get the best score I can, because that makes me so much more marketable to coaches. Yeah, it, it really, it really depends on the institution. Just an example: I went to the University of Arizona, you know, D1 in the in the Pac-12 conference, and the university with no scholarship costs fifty thousand US dollars. They offer up to thirty-five thousand dollar in merit-based aid or academic scholarship, what you're referring to, just for having good grades. I think it's if you have a 1410 on the SAT and close to a 4.0. So that's 70% in itself. So every school is different in terms of how large their academic scholarships are for their internationals. Um, 
but yeah, like it, it, it kind of just depends on the institution. If you're looking for maybe something more academically focused, you know, um, you know, maybe a D3 is the best option for you. Division threes can't offer athletic scholarship. They can offer academics. You're not going to get a full scholarship at a D3, but you know, people are there. You're still treated like a student athlete. You still get great facilities, but you know, all the scholarship is given academically and uh, they're, they're usually very, very strong schools, you know, NYU, um, MIT, um, Carnegie Mellon, schools like that, you know, Caltech, very, very academic schools. One quick question I noticed that I can answer very quickly. Is it possible to get full scholarships for field hockey? Um, on the women's side, yes. We've had an amazing success rate with women's uh, field hockey uh, numerous numerous uh, full scholarships to division one schools on the men's side it's it's not uh, a very well funded sport if at all i'm not 100 no it's not a sport it's, no it's not a sport not offered collegiately on the men's side just on the women's no. side so, um, sadly yes on the women's side no on the men's side um an sat score of 1400 plus makes one eligible for what university specifically um You've got a 1400 plus, you're looking at a very good selection of universities. You're, you're qualifying for the vast majority. Um, typically with a 1400, you're looking at that sort of usually, depending on the area of the field of study that you're looking at, probably within that top 100 ranked universities. Every institution has different academic standards and requirements. Harvard is different to NYU. Princeton is different to Bucknell, for example. Um, you know, so a 1400 is a very good score, fantastic score. If that's what you've got, congrats. And, um, you know, you're probably looking at a extremely high quality of education. And to most universities in America, you're probably qualifying for an extremely strong academic scholarship. You know, 1400, for example, at Harvard might be very touch and go whether or not you get in. But uh, a division two in Tennessee, for example, you'll get in and probably qualify for a huge amount of academic scholarship. So. It completely depends on the institutions that you're targeting. Mm -hmm. um, they need to call question. me, Joe. You didn't add that part. They need to call mm -hmm. me. 1,400, I'm interested. <laughs> a question about soccer and volleyball in the same season, and can you compete in both? Um, volleyball is actually a fall and spring sport. Um, it kind of starts, yeah, it kind of goes through from both. So difficult probably not achievable um if you're talking about you know football soccer um that's not really going to be achievable because the season's kind of going to kind of start in the end of the, the volleyball season will start in the end of the football season so probably it's, very very difficult it's usually a conversation that you would have with the coaches once you've arrived um if that's something you want to explore every coach is going to look at that differently um i actually played american football for one season um, you know, when I was playing soccer as well. And the American football season was the same season, but it drifted into the spring season as well, where soccer doesn't. My coach was comfortable me playing in the spring, um, but not comfortable playing in the fall. Um, so it completely depends on your coach. And that's usually a conversation that you would have with the coaches. I would focus on one sport and market yourself as one sport. And if there is value there for you to do both, that's a conversation typically that you'd have with the coach upon arrival. Brilliant. Um, and that's, that's something that will come to the forefront when we're doing our assessments and when we're yeah. uh, talking with them mm -hmm. about a strategic long-term game. Mm -hmm. We have another question about the, the CSEC, is it? Yeah. CSEC and oh, Kate. It? We, will, we will take uh, a deeper look, me and the, the eligibility side of things. It says you don't have mathematics. That's usually a core class, but if you've taken it at any point in your four years, you of high school you should be okay so um if not maybe junior college is the option but we'd have to take a, a closer look um, um, Fabian, um it's, yeah. it's unusual if you're going to school in the caribbean and you're at the csec level and you haven't done um math and english i mean it happens but it's it's unusual okay okay we're not we're not have passed it but you should have at least done it yeah okay brilliant um do ASM give scholarships to Jamaicans? And if yes, how often does it happen? I just had a Jamaican athlete. Her name is Tanil James. She just committed two days ago on a, on a track and field scholarship out here. So <laughs> we, 
we have had you know, <laughs> recent success. Um, not hundreds of success stories um, from Jamaica, but you know that's why you know we're working here together tonight. Yeah, don't uh, we? And bringing all you and, guys uh, here. And, um, and a big and a big shout out to um, you, Lewis, uh, um, ASM affiliate scout in Jamaica, who was responsible for the lovely Tanil and myself. And you are working closely, and we're thick and fast with other ones coming right behind who are currently waiting to be assessed with ASM. So the channel is open and waiting for other student athletes to jump on board for sure. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Kind of wrapping up the last few questions. Can How I add to that? Can I add to that one, uh, Fabian? Yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. So uh, we're all Caribbean people. So let's not only talk about Jamaica. We've got about six or so um, from the um, Barbados. Um, of course, Mikhail, who is at Troy. Then we have Andre Appleway, who is at um, Coastal Bend Community College. And then we had Nathan Skeet, who was at Northern Iowa. And then we have the young lady, uh, Dana Braffitt, volleyball player at um, John Wood, I believe, as well. And then we got a whole host of other ones for 2022. And I think we got one or two for 2023 as well. And we have, um, um, what's his name? Um, Brian Desmond from Bermuda, mm -hmm. um, committed already. And then we got the lovely um, Taylor White, who's getting so much coach connections. I mean, she came on board and immediately she had about four or five coach connections. Um, we told her D2 and we still had D1s coming that wanted to talk to her as well. So the path is open for the Caribbean. I think the Caribbean's issue was uh, communication and education. And that's what this webinar is about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, next question. How would grading for GED student work? Um, GED is very, very similar to the American system. Um, so it, it is almost accepted at all universities. So GED is, is definitely acceptable. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Before we, before you, you dive into this process, make sure someone checks through throughout the eligibility, um, and make sure that the, the target universities or conferences and divisions that you're looking at, you know, you make sure you're, you're all set on, on that side of things. Um, playing for your national team makes you how much more of a hot commodity. Um, obviously that carries a huge amount of weight, you know, with coaches, obviously Fabs works more on the placement side of things, working, speaking with coaches every day. We work with a, a long, long, long list of international, you know, athletes that represent their country. And ultimately you've reached the pinnacle, you know, typically of, of standard of that sport in that country. And that's why you've been recognized to represent that country. So it's extremely well received um, as a, you know, as a coach out here. So that's one thing that we ask in our assessment. Have you ever represented your country or have you ever represented, you know, internationally or anything like that? Um, competed internationally because that you have to be at a certain level within any sport to do that. So, yes, you will be likely a hot commodity. And I can testify to that. I mean, the Barbados under 17 national soccer team has found about five different um, ASM recruits so far. And what started to happen is as head coaches started to see the video footage come in, they started to see other people behind passing the ball to the person who was highlighted. And amazing thing happened. They actually called up ASM and said, the young gentleman who we now know is this person's name, that person's name, and that person's name, can you connect us with them because they are people that we would love to have on our team. So the whole thing about playing nationally, I mean, CONCACAF and what that means to be able to play and show how good you are against other national teams, that's the level of competitive play that we wanna capture highlight footage of to springboard a coach into saying, yes, we wanna have a conversation with you. You can be an impact player on my team. Absolutely. Um, the next question kind of ties in. There's two questions. Um, Damaris's question of with the COVID restrictions and no competition events, how will this affect the recruitment? Um, I'll kind of answer this with, with another one. Another question about there's no swimming competitions in Jamaica, training still going on, but there's no time trials. Would the last best time, you know, kind of count? Um, Look, with this, we, coaches coaches know that everyone is in the same boat right now. There are, you know, country, some countries are more shut down than others in terms of competitions. 
but you know that's when it helps to have someone who knows the coaches when you're when you're looking at going there because if you think of this kind of like going to university as a job interview you know we're the reference here um we're gonna obviously you know market a lot of your old times and you know see what kind of training progressions you've had since then um but yeah it's uh it's it's all about you know putting putting your information to the right coaches having someone back you um that the coaches know um but you know with a lack of competitions it's really about you know swimming those fast times when you've got the opportunity um you know and it it really depends on on how long ago it was you last competed and when you're looking to come out and if you can't compete before you're coming out so lots of different moving parts there we'll take a look at your old times we'll take a look at how long ago that was when you might next compete and all that kind of stuff um all you know comes into account maybe you're already good enough um to to swim at a lot of schools so we just have to take a a, a deeper look into that if i don't next question if i don't have any sat scores is it still possible for me to gain a scholarship um for this year with covid a lot of sats got cancelled so a lot of programs or universities became test optional so you don't need the test if you didn't have it they will accept your high school grades um and a lot of them are thinking about continuing that to 2022 remaining test optional so it depends on the institution you're looking at having an sat i would always say you know try and get a test because it's always going to be accepted and it's always going to you know maximize them the amount of schools that we can talk to but there are certainly a lot of schools that are test optional for this year and are likely to be for next year so kind of depends on the institution and and timeline and things i mean if you don't have an sat score and are trying to come out for 2021 with everything going on probably taking a gap year at this point might be a good idea or you know if there, there are still a lot of coaches recruiting now for 2021 so it would be about you know finding a school that's definitely test optional and finding one that fit for you for sure Awesome. I think we're all wow. answered those questions. Wow. Yeah. We answered 40 questions. Good yeah. grief. Okay, people. Wow. I think it's time to, to wrap up. And yeah. I can say the closing words if, if you guys are good. Yeah. Um, this was an amazing experience for me. Um, born out of my wanting to reach out and touch in a good way <laughs> and share information in a good way with as many families and student athletes as, as I could, especially in, in this part of the world, the region and, and furthermore, the Commonwealth and beyond. Um, too many times I'd be talking to families and they'd be absolutely flabbergasted by the information that I was giving them. And they'd made decisions that really hampered their ability for their student athlete to secure a good sports scholarship at a great school. So um, I really want to thank um, one lady in particular. I don't know if she wants me to say her name or not, but she's a, a guidance counselor at a leading um, school in Jamaica. It is true art, my introduction and speaking to her. And actually, that introduction was made by a student athlete and her family who I actually spoke to. But it's out of that that came the idea of why, do, don't, why don't we share this information with as much people as possible, especially the situation that Jamaica is in with no head coaches coming for 2020 and, and practically none coming for 2021. So tonight I wanna thank um, all of the student athletes, their families, their coaches, their sporting associations, their federations in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Suriname, and in Guyana, and any other countries that I haven't mentioned at this webinar has reached out to you. I wanna thank you very much for your time I really didn't think it was going to be this long, so I apologize if it's been too long for people. But um, um, Fabian or Joe, I would like to add my information in again. So I, I will add my information again at the end of, the, of this vote of thanks. But again, we at ASM are proud to be here on a Friday night to assist and help all of these families and these student athletes in their search and their quest on the pathway to success for them to secure the best possible US and Canadian. We didn't even mention that, that we do also deal with Canadian universities. 
sports scholarships that can be had. Um, thank you so very much for joining us tonight. And hopefully in the next day or two or three or next week ahead, um, people can start booking some sessions with me so that I can actually drill all this information down to make it specific to each and every student athlete and each and every family. Thank you so very much. Good night. Good yeah. evening. You have to Trinidad, Michelle. Oh my gosh. Trinidad, what was I, yeah. Oh gosh, man. What was <laughs> I thinking? Okay, Trini Massive. <laughs> Major apologies. I think I think I said Caribbean though. If I start calling all the islands in the, in the Caribbean, I'll be here till tomorrow. But yeah. very, 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 very much so. There's a very strong Trinidadian contingent that I have spoken to on many different occasions with water polo, with swimming, with um, tennis, with soccer, and a whole bunch of other different sports. So absolutely um, hailing out to Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much personally for being here tonight. I want you to have a great evening and a wonderful weekend. And I look forward to speaking to all of you personally. And as I said, helping you on that pathway to success. Bye. Bye-bye.